the saline wetlands are made up of a mix of fresh water and the saline water from underground. The groundwater is a recharged in the front range of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. That water over tens of thousands of years has moved across the plains. As it does that, moves through these bedrock formations under the ground. It picks up salts that were laid down when this area millions of years ago was covered by ocean and for whatever reason it hits some resistance right around the floodplains here near Lincoln and it gets under pressure. When it's under pressure it wants to push up and rise to the surface and so when it reaches the surface it creates a saline wetland. I love the saline wetlands um, a couple of reasons. Uh, they're very unique and so they're just not found anywhere else and they're very very rare and they're important biologically. They provide a lot of important services to people, so a place to go, flood control, water quality improvement, wildlife observations. You can be back here and, and you're just outside of the city of Lincoln, you're like a five minute walk from the parking lot, and yet you're out here in, in a very wild space. And so I think that's a real benefit of these areas. I live in Lincoln, my kids were raised in Lincoln, my grandkids are close by. And so it's a place that I can come out and refresh, recharge my soul. Good evening, Ewi de Wangi de, Ebebelite Wiblatamik, Umaha Jaje Wiwitate Shonge Hube Wau. Wahe Jaje Wiwitate Rene Sansusi, Umaha Waubli. I said, All my relations. My Umaha name is Sacred Horsewoman, and my English name is Rene Sansusi, and I'm an Umaha woman. Our homelands are all eastern Nebraska, western Iowa, and where I live is here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Born here and spent well over half my life here. Our name for Lincoln is Niskide, and Niskide means salt because this is where the Omaha tribe used to come and gather our salt. Here, you know, in the Omaha tribe book, I was reading about uh, not only you know the plants and uh, food, but about salt. And what it said was salt was obtained from a stream near the present city of Lincoln, Nebraska, known to the Omaha as Salt Creek, the waters of which left on the grassy banks a white saline deposit. This fine salt the women brushed into piles by means of feathers, and afterward it was deposited in bladder bags for future use. We took it home and utilized it in any number of ways, you know, whether it was to help preserve our food, to help with uh, tanning our, our hides. So all the multiple uses uh, we have for salt today, that's what we were doing back in the day, you know, before uh, colonization. Native Americans had recognized and used the, the salt for, for thousands of years, but when we had European settlers arrive in the 1800s, they recognized the, the importance of uh, saline wetlands and the salts that they were producing as a commodity to use. Salt back in the 1800s was a very rare commodity, very expensive and so they were taking hundreds of thousands of barrels a year of salt and exporting it out of Lincoln to market across the nation. But when that industry collapsed, they lost their value to the people. The city was already established, so the city did what cities do, you know, it kept growing. Historically, the estimate that we've kind of settled on is around 20,000 acres of saline wetlands that were here in the mid-1800s. The estimate today is in that three to 4,000 acre range. And the final thing that really affected the wetlands was the alteration of Salt Creek and the tributaries. Because the city developed along the stream, they wanted ways to move that water out of the city as fast as possible. 
Pirates. So they channelized Salt Creek and some of the tributaries. They were successful in moving that water faster, but it started to affect the stream itself. The wetlands got altered because the streams were altered. The saline water, instead of coming up into the wetlands on the floodplain, now discharges into these deepened incised streams and we get less saline water into the wetlands than we historically did. I was reading that now we only have pockets of the wetlands left. And I too, you know, growing up, I never really thought about it. There was nobody there to explain to me what they were. You know, I mean, my parents were busy all the time. So they didn't have the chance to take us out here. You know, maybe they didn't think there were locations we could go. But this is my first time being out, like right out on the land. So I really appreciate this time. I look at this, you know, at these lands and I feel that connection, that ancestral connection to, to the saline wetlands. So now it's up to us you know, to, to make that reconnection and come back out here, you know, start engaging again. We can't lose that connection. The Salt Creek Tiger Beetle is this really interesting insect that is only found here in the saline wetlands around Lincoln, Nebraska. They're called tiger beetles because they're pretty ferocious, if you will. I mean, they will attack just about anything that moves. They've got these huge jaws on them, what they call raptorial jaws. Tiger beetles as a group are found just about worldwide, and there's thousands of different species. The Salt Creek tiger beetle is one that evolved with the saline wetlands. You just don't find them anyplace else. As Lincoln began to grow and the wetlands were drained, their populations started going down. Probably one of the rarest animals in the world. Uh, you know, we're ha we have population estimates of two, three, four hundred individuals, which is extremely tiny for any type of, of living being, let alone an insect. Last year we were just around 300, and that's us walking around counting individuals in each of the areas we know they still persist. Nope. Can't fly with the darn, yep, that's probably one. <laughs> Salt Creek tiger beetle is, uh, is on the endangered list. It was actually listed by Nebraska Game and Parks in, in uh, 2000, and then a few years later um, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, as a federally listed endangered species. Once Salt Creek tiger beetle was listed, you know, we really started looking at what needs to be done to increase populations. We started releasing them in 2011. So what we do is we've got these cafeteria trays filled with little condiment cups and we go out to what we think is a nice area for tiger beetles to be and we take that lid off and dump out a mixture of saline soil in there and look for the beetle larvae which again is just this little tiny uh, white thing. And then we have paintbrushes that we use to put a hole in the ground. And then we put the larvae down on the ground and then we put a little bit of soil on top and then they're good to go. We get the question a lot of, of, of why are we trying to save this one little bug? And, and it's a good insect to have as a indicator species of how the wetlands are doing. The saline wetland area that I worked on for my graduate project is called Marsh Wren Community Wetland. So 
I work closely with the Saline Wetland Conservation Partnership. It's a small team of people, Ted LaGrange, Dan Schultz, and Tom Malmstrom. The Saline Wetland Conservation Partnership goal is to conserve the remaining saline wetlands. Marsh Wren, about 40th and um, Arbor Road, that is owned by the Lower Platte South NRD. It's kind of an experiment. It's been very successful. Dan Schultz was integral to the development of that site and some of the opportunities that we're, we're learning from by doing it a different way. We knew that there were, were uh, saline features, saline wetland features on this property. This was the first time we, in a big way, pump out water to the surface. The wells are between 180 and 190 feet deep. The water is so saline, it's two thirds of the way to seawater. It's very, very salty. The salts that come into this system create some habitat, especially for some unique um, plants. So there's probably a dozen species of plants that are, are really adapted to growing in these highly saline environments. Marsh Ran Community Wetland taught me the power of conservation science and restoration planning because when I started my project there, it looked nothing like it looks like today. It's been crazy to see how much that place has changed. They transformed that place in a matter of three to five years. They've brought saline wetlands back. So do you guys see the like really bright green plants that are like kind of right in the middle all by themselves. That's the salt wart, which is a state endangered plant. Something that I got to do recently was teach classes out at Marsh Rand Community Wetland. That was really neat to be able to take college students out and show them a landscape that, you know, most of them had never seen before and they'd never been in before. I was like coming down here to look for tracks, so why don't you guys just, I think we got like five minutes left or something. So why don't you guys just take a brain break and explore, like see how many tracks you can find. And just like when I was exploring the saline wetlands for the first time, you know, you can see like kind of that awe on people's faces and the surprise that it's like, wait, Nebraska used to be an ocean. This used to be underwater. Wait, is that really salt on the surface? And I learned through the project that there's this give and take. Like, what is that gonna look like when we keep expanding our cities? Are we gonna think about wetlands when we build more neighborhoods? I hope so, because they're valuable. We're standing in a biologically unique landscape. So it's an area to find on a map that is identified as a biodiversity hotspot. These areas get used by a lot of waterfowl and also very important for shorebirds. Some of those are long distance migrants that are going up to the Arctic to nest, but they use these areas as refueling stops, is, is basically a place to bring on food, put on energy, put on fat reserves so they can do their long distance migration. There's a camera that was placed on a dead tree at, at Marsh Wren Wildlife Area. Those dead trees or snags can provide important habitat for a lot of different species. And that was put there and to just document the different species that might use a, a dead branch. And so it seems pretty simple, but it's kind of amazing how many wildlife that use that snag. Turn it on. Now, see what happens.
My name's Madeline Cass. I am from Lincoln. I was born here and very much live here by choice because I've moved away many times and just keep finding myself back in Nebraska. Art was really the thing that kept me grounded and was like a source of joy for me. I don't think I remember my first time in the Saline Wetlands. I feel like my first true experience in the salt marshes was when Michael Forsberg and I took a drive to Arbor Lake one afternoon. I remember getting out of the car and I think I just started to like weep. Um, I was really moved immediately by the beauty of the grasses and how wet the ground was and it was this immediate connection to place and so I just kept going back out there on my own after that and was really grateful that he took me out there at the moment when he did. Frank Shoemaker was a naturalist and ornithologist and writer. He was a sort of an early adopter of conservation of the marshes and of biodiversity in this region in general. I've spent some time in the Special Collections archives at the University of Nebraska, and they have all of his photographs and letters. And so just through spending time reading some of his notes and journals, which was a really powerful experience, I really felt like I got to know him a little bit through them. It just really seems like he was ahead of the curve in terms of thinking about protecting wildlife and protecting this region. I really look up to him. So I decided that it was important to promote what was happening in the marshes, especially once I recognized the amount of development that has encroached around them. Wanted to make a piece of art, but didn't know what sort of format would make sense for being the best steward to the land and connecting people to it through my experiences and through my eyes. Recognizing the diversity of materials and all of these different elements, I started to find this little trail and I realized that the best way to bring them all together in a thoughtful way was through a book. I think that it was something I just wrote in my journal and sometimes these lines of little poetry just start to like kick around in my head and um, that was one of them. Just through thinking about this place and recognizing that it's important and it's underappreciated. So I wanted to sort of personify this place and help it have a voice and it felt like if it did, it would be asking to be noticed. Why are saline wetlands important? I think they're sort of the the most obvious answers, which are if we build in the floodplains or if we fill in wetlands and destroy them, then the flooding in our cities is going to be way worse. As an artist, another important one to me is just beauty. I think life is really depressing without beauty. Here in Nebraska, we don't have mountains, we don't have beaches, but we do have magical weird little pockets of places like this. I feel like every time I am in the wetlands, I discover something new, whether it be about the landscape or about myself. They're so surprising and incredible. It's just like a wealth of everything that we need. It's like a reflection. So I'm very grateful for them.